Hello and welcome to lecture three. So today we're picking up where we left off last time, talking about building combinational logic modules in Chisel. Uh, right before we do that, I do want to draw everyone's attention and remind them that we have, oops, sorry, get that changed over. If you go to our course website, you can click around, especially on the calendar, adding more content, including a link uh, to our lectures repo. And we've pushed this content publicly. And so if you want to go ahead and play with these notebooks while we're lecturing, you don't need to install anything. You can just click this link and launch a binder, which I can do right now. It takes me about a minute or two for the binder to spin up. So I'm going to lecture locally and I don't want to wait for that. But just something for the future to be aware of this is going to be possible. Right? It takes a little bit of time for it to pull in all the dependencies for our class, but you can do this here without having to install anything. Actually, see, it's here it's going through uh, steps. So I'm going to go back and go forward to lecture. So uh, as promised, uh, today we're talking about more about how we want to kind of parameterize our modules, but really just also doing a better job of trying to understand what's going on with these modules, right? So I'm going to spend a little bit more time using a little bit of Scala, then a little bit of Chisel, and kind of showing how the two interact. Uh, in particular, we're talking about things like conditionals or muxes. And then we'll, hopefully after today's lecture, you'll feel pretty comfortable implementing a module's combinational and even adding a little bit of parameterization to it. So uh, let's go ahead and, you know, load Chisel into our notebooks. This is probably going to go a little quicker than it does on Binder because this is local on my platform and hopefully it is cached, so it should take only a few seconds. Um, but once we have that, of course, we have the access to use our stuff on um, the notebook. Great. Uh, usually it's quicker in this. I'm a little surprised it's taking this long. Um, in the meantime, I see there's a couple of concerns from chat uh, about Audio seems like it's worked out. Okay, great. And then finish the first step, and there's the second step. Great. So we go on and go forward. Okay, so I mentioned this in passing uh, on the last lecture, but if you want to implement a MUX in Chisel, you have a few options. One is you can do it explicitly and say, hey, I want a MUX, right? And so you, it's a function that takes three arguments, right? You say, hey, I want to have my select signal. And then a MUX, of course, chooses between two inputs, right, based on select signal. And so uh, you actually take them in the order of input one, then input zero, right? So select is one, you actually get in one, and select is zero, you take in zero. So to some folks, and myself included, this is perhaps a little bit of a counterintuitive uh, ordering because you might, you know, suspect or plan to, um, uh, you know, usually you go input select zero one. The reason why this is chosen by the language designers is this is, you know, consistent with the ternary operator, uh, which is available in both Verilog and C. So there's a lot more flavors of muxes. We'll come back to that later. But for now, here's our, our instantiation, right? So we have a simple module, a couple inputs, uh, you know, the two input ways, as well as select signal, and then the output. OK. So we print our Verilog. It's going to take a second for it to run through. Uh, and that shouldn't be too crazy. Um, and there we have it, right? So OK, we've, you know, Produced a, uh, a mux, right? And this is a Verilog style mux with the ternary statement. Okay, so using select signal, if this evaluates to true, we do in one, otherwise we do in zero. Okay, not too crazy. Um, let's go ahead and do some stuff with that, right? So, uh, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go back into the question. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, so the, yeah, so the, the question from chat is, what is this business? Uh, and that is something that the Chisel front end has done to help us debug later on. So uh, like I said, because when you're using Chisel or language like that, it's an embedded language, how do you reconcile one language with another language in this, its output? Well, the way we do that in this case is uh, it actually records the output, uh, sorry, the input line, so you know where it came from. So you look at the final Verilog or some other file, you want to know where it came from in a chisel. This will help you debug it. Now today, because we're running inside of a notebook, the line numbers aren't as helpful. Um, and so normally it would be like, you know, a file name and then a, you know, line number and a colon, uh, you know, and, and then a column number, right? So um, the reason why it's .sc, so uh, a Scala file is .scala. A .sc file is actually something referred to as Ammonite. Uh, it's a little bit of under the hood stuff we're using in order to 
uh, make Scala run in a Jupyter notebook, right? And so, uh, you know, because here this is inside of, you know, a, a notebook cell that's getting under the hood, you know, put into uh, a file uh, that's being run as Ammonite. But, uh, you know, when you're, when you're larger projects, you look at the Verilog, you will still see these similar annotations, but they'll have more sensical, you know, files, usually or something Scala, you know, and they help you track it down. And it's going to be helpful sometimes to be able to see that information. Um, but remember, this is a comment, so it doesn't have any impact on the uh, functionality. No, no problem. No problem. Great. So, uh, all right. And as I said, there's a lot more flavors of these muxes. Um, same rule that you muxes do one hot, or if you want to do a lot more cases at once, uh, look inside a chill documentation, you can see some of these other muxes and see what's out there. Um, but sometimes it's handy to just have a simple two input mux. Okay. Um, now let's do a little bit more about Scala. So uh, in Scala, we've been using classes. You may not even realize that right? these modules we've been instantiating are a class. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about what's on with Scala's classes, right? And so um, you perhaps are familiar with classes from other object-oriented languages. There's a little bit of interesting uh, tricks about the way Scala does it. So uh, when we describe the class, uh, we actually take you know, arguments right away. And these are the arguments to the default constructor, right? So when we instantiate a class later on, we need to give these fields, right? And then, um, meanwhile, the entire body of the class is evaluated when the class is instantiated. And so the body, in a way, is kind of like the constructor. So if you want to do various things and set various internal values, you do that right away inside of here. Uh, and then, in and so right now we're just setting a couple internal values in your print line, but you can imagine, of course, later on, maybe you want to define, uh, you know, methods or functions inside there or something else. We'll cover that later. But for now, we're just covering just a little bit so we can see how we can, you know, take a parameter into uh, a class or instantiate it and then use it, right? So, for example, we, we had the class here, we're taking the string parameter and integer parameter. Uh, we have an internal field we're going to set to that string parameter, and then we're going to print this thing out when it's created, right? So... Um, simply, let me go ahead and comment out the rest of this. Simply instantiate, sorry, simply creating this class is going to just define the class, right? Now, if I actually uh, instantiate it, now you can see in our output stream, they call that print line. And this is a brief note about these Jupyter uh, cells. Uh, of course, this is the code we're writing. Anything we print out comes out here, and then this, uh, these lines here, this is kind of just us letting us know the result of these evaluations, but this isn't necessarily what the print statements, right? This is just, you know, evaluating these statements. So saying, oh wait, you know, that first statement was, you know, uh, a class definition, the second statement produced something called MC, which is of type my class. And yeah, here's the details of how it's implemented in memory in Ammonite. Um, cool, but you know, so like I said, if there's a val inside of a class, we can go ahead and refer to that externally, uh, you know, no problem. Uh, so we can go see that name, right? And by default, there's ways to have access restrictions, but by default, it's public, right? So you can go in and do that. And this might sound a little nerve-wracking, but remember that we're hoping that most of our fields are vals, right? In which case, uh, you know, we're not too worried about somebody tampering for values. Now, perhaps there's a concern that maybe they'll look at an internal value you don't want them to depend on. Sometimes, you know, people do use types of, you know, protected or private and those sorts of modifiers, but not super important for now. Um, now, uh, to kind of remind ourselves some things we talked about so far in this course, if we go ahead and, you know, let's say we try to modify name. Of course, remember, we can't do that because name's a val, right? So if we made it a var, yes, we could, but we can't initially because it was a val, right? Um, meanwhile, if we want to access an argument given at the time the class was created, one of those top parameters, we actually can't do that. Uh, by default, um, they are actually uh, constrained just to the class. And so we need to go ahead and just toss in a val up here to let people know, let it know that it is, um, should be publicly accessible. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and undo these real quick and we'll keep going. No questions so far. Great. Alrighty, so with that in mind, we can now go ahead and parameterize our mux. So before we had a mux that was, you know, one bit inputs. Now I want to do some uints, right? But the question is, how wired is uints? Uh, well, we can take in a bit width. So maybe we'll call that bit width n. 
this is a Scala variable, and then we're using that as our width, right? So you see that our mux is selecting between, you know, n0 and n1 based on s. So s is, you know, a single bit bool just to have that selection. And then the output, of course, is the one we selected. So we'll still use the exact same mux syntax. Just the difference is now we've slightly parameterized that model from before to make it a little bit more flexible, right? We tossed in a parameter here, and that's now the bit width we're using for these fields. So actually, if we, you know, uh, we'll actually leave it as 8 first, and we'll run it, and we'll see the, the result, right? And so today we're looking at the Verilog quite a bit, not because we expect you to do no Verilog for this course, but just as kind of a way to kind of see concretely what hardware is getting produced by our, our, our evaluations. Um, so yeah, you can see, okay, the fields are, you know, 8 bits, still using this, the, the, the Verilog ternary statement, not too crazy. You know, what if I made this uh, a 1? You know, it's basically exactly like we had before. It's not even a bus anymore. It's just a one-bit signal. You know, but if I want to make this a thousand, because why not? Also possible, right? So we've just made a parameterized bit with mux, right? Um, it's something this simple and small. You probably wouldn't even, uh, you know, bother making a module, but today it suffices us to kind of show some capabilities that are possible. Okay. Maybe I'll go ahead and make that back to eight. Uh, and so as a general kind of design practice making these kinds of parameterizations, you should recommend the parameters themselves be Scala types. And that way you can do kind of proper programming kind of things with them. And then when you need to, sometimes you may need to cast them to like a chisel uint, or in this case, to a chisel bit width, do the casting at the place you need to be chiseled. But otherwise, you know, try and keep these parameters in the Scala land as long as you can. It's always kind of easier to deal with it. Um, so the question from chat is, okay, well here we're using this mux thing all the time and it's a two to one. What if I want more inputs? Uh, so in that library I mentioned a few slides ago, there is more um, descriptions of uh, ways to um, instantiate different types of muxes that are pre-built in the library, as well as today and later in the lecture, we'll, we'll learn about ways to implicitly define muxes and that might handle some of the cases you're concerned about. Uh, there's a few other questions in chat that I kind of respond to. Uh, one is regarding with these Verilog, we see it keep doing, you know, seven colon zero. Uh, those of us, you know, that are Verilog veterans know that, you know, if we want to reverse the order of bits or evaluate it, we can do zero colon seven. Um, that kind of, you know, one liner bit reverse, so to speak, uh, to reverse the order of how we label the bits. Uh, chisels not have the capability. However, fortunately, uh, we don't need to do this very often, right? How often do you need to reverse all the bits all at once? And so, uh, the default notation for chisel bit addressing is most significant bit on the left to least significant bit on the right. So least significant bit is, you know, zero index. And then, you know, most significant bit is, you know, the bit length minus one. Um, and uh, we'll be coming back to bit widths uh, a little bit later in this lecture today. Okay, so can we talk a little bit about the assignment? Uh, and how come I can reassign this type? Uh, that's the question from chat coming in. Uh, I believe when we get to that in just a slide or two, the question is about what's going on here, right? Isn't out like a val? Shouldn't that be, you know, immutable? Uh, how am I reassigning it here? Great question. I believe that's like my next slide. Let's see. Uh, nope, it's going to be in about 10 minutes, but it'll be great. We'll come, we'll come back to that question. If I don't, please, please, please come back. Please ask me that again. Okay, so in this prior slide, you know, we've done some little bit of parameterization, and now we've now taking in some information and kind of changing our bit width dynamic, which is kind of cool. Let's go ahead, oops, we don't need to reevaluate that. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about a little bit more Scala. So we've actually gotten this far and we haven't even talked about control structures in the programming language. Yeah, guess what? We're gonna need this. And we're not even gonna worry about loops until next week, <laughs> but today we're gonna talk about just if else. Uh, and so uh, what we mean by just if else, of course, yeah, we want to uh, do things and so, the if else in Scala is like you're familiar with two of many programming languages, right? You know, if condition is true, do that body. If it's not true, take the else, right? And now uh, you're not required to have an else. It can just be an if by itself. Um, and you also have an else if, right? That's all the same. I think the one wrinkle makes Chisel of Scala a little bit interesting about their ifs is that ifs aren't just a control structure. They actually return a value, right? So, um, you know, for example, we can do something like this, where I can say, if based on condition, you know, return these numbers into it. So technically what it does is it returns the last line of the evaluated clause. Um, and so that's kind of pretty helpful, right? In terms of parentheses, like other languages, if it's one line, you don't even need to have them, but if it's multi-line, uh, you should, you have to. Uh, it's 
strongly recommended uh, that if you do these one-liners where it's just uh, returning a value rather than doing something mutable, um, it's, you can put them all in one line. It's kind of a very nice, clean syntax, no parentheses. Uh, so that should work just fine. Okay. So now we can maybe consider some uh, interesting, uh, maybe little wrinkles on this, right? Okay. So like I said, uh, you know, we can um, uh, have an if statement return. Uh, so, for example, if I did this, what's going to happen? So wait, what 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 the heck happened, right? We we did, we executed a true case, and then we return that to uh, x. Um, and so, what is it? Well, what that is is if that there's something called unit, which is shown as uh, empty parentheses, which is kind of like this like empty type. It's not quite empty, but it's like this non-existent type, so to speak, right? So, for example, if I was to instead, uh, you know, maybe uh, just assign val x, uh, sorry, uh, you know, to a print line result, we're going to see the same thing, right? It's going to, you know, it's, of course, the print line is a side effect of, you know, printing to the terminal, but, you know, the result of a print line uh, is, you know, an, a unit, unit's basically like a void, right? There's no actual return. Um, and, uh, okay, cool. So, uh, there we have that. Um, and so, yeah, so that's doing an if, else, and Scala. So remember, this is if, else, and Scala. And we just talked about muxes and chisel. So now I want to kind of put the two side by side to make sure we're not getting mixed up on what's, which is which, right? So both of them do conditional things, right? Based on something, you take some other action. But it's a matter of not just which language you're using, but actually when this evaluation occurs, right? So if we put it in a circuit in chisel, uh, at that point, it's actual hardware, right? So when we have a mux, we are actually generating the stuff for both paths and using a mux to select one, right? So in this case, you know, if we're doing like, you know, a mux to maybe do absolute value, you know, if it's negative, we're going to invert it. If not, take the original value. We're actually going to have, you know, this negator, a comparator, and a mux. Right? We're going to have both paths all in hardware. However, if we um, do this in Scala, maybe we're doing a very similar operation, but in this case, maybe we want to do an inversion. This is evaluated at the time the hardware is generated. So if invert is true, we're going to have hardware with a negator. If invert is false, we're going to have hardware without the negator, right? So that's kind of what's going on here is, yeah, we have, um, it's kind of important to keep these two straight, right? So this is, you know, Scala things, of course, evaluated at, uh, you know, design generation time, the program's running. Versus things in hardware, you know, that that conditional behavior happens in the actual hardware. It's going to happen based on the real inputs, right? Um, so I just want to make sure you can keep that very clear. Uh, usually this is not too confusing, but occasionally later on we'll start seeing, uh, we'll start mixing if statements into our designs. It's important to remember if statements are kind of us choosing which code we're unlocking. Um, oh, I'm warned to have a typo, and yes, uh, I do. And what's great about this is I can do it like that, and I fixed it. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, the question is, what about the signedness? Uh, yeah, it would be better <laughs> if this was a signed thing. Um, but I mean, technically, you can do less than on a on a uint. It just may not have the behavior you want in this particular application. Uh, but great, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, okay, so let's keep going. Um, and I think now we're gonna come back to that question we were just talking about. What's going on with that uh, connect statement? So uh, the kind of trying to keep in mind what's going on with this process is we're making a generator. It's just a program, right? It just so happens this program is working uh, with these chisel objects and connecting them together. And so that's what's going on is that uh, if you think about what's going on, this is the XR gate from last uh, lecture. Remember, we had this little XR gate. And to kind of drive the point home, you know, I added in the val. So it's totally fine to, you know, name a bit of uh, chisel and then, you know, use that name it later on, right? So these Scala things, they're references, right? So they're references to chisel objects, right? So we have chisel objects for inputs, chisel objects for outputs, a chisel object for the XOR gate. And so what happens is, if you imagine this at the very beginning uh, of our module instantiation, okay, with these references, we have, you know, val, io, a, b, c. And so when the, when the ios are, you know, instantiated, 
these inputs are instantiating these objects, right? And then this line right here, my gate equals uh, these things. What does that do? Well, this XOR gate causes an XOR gate to be instantiated as a chisel object. And then it refers to uh, these two, um, uh, you know, other chisel objects, right? Now, technically, uh, in the case of inputs, it actually is only registered on this side. This side doesn't even know it's an output. But once again, small detail. The important thing is that, okay, so this statement has, you know, created these, added this chisel object, connected these other chisel objects to it. And now we have a reference in Scala land to this object we just created, right? And then the next line uh, is a connect statement, and it connects this object to another object, right? And how we knew how to find the object, of course, yeah, we could go io.c. But the key thing is that uh, these Scala references aren't really changing, right? They're still pointing to a thing object. What we are changing is uh, how these chisel objects are connected. So in response to this question for a few minutes ago, uh, if you know, okay, well, shoot, what's going on with this stuff or how are we able to reassign things? We've not reassigned C, right? Uh, IO.C still points to an output object, right? That's still what it's pointing to. But um, uh, what's going on is that um, we've changed these chisel objects internally, right? So uh, it's an important distinction to be clear about. Uh, this is true not just in Chisel, but in Scala as well. In Scala, you can have a val, an immutable reference, to a mutable object, right? So let's think about what it means for a second. So that means uh, no matter what I do, this reference is always going to point to the same object, but the contents of the object can change, right? So, so far with the things that, you know, like val x equals 4 or something, uh, you know, that's a constant 4, so that thing's not going to change, and a reference to it is not going to change. However, later on, you may want to use a collection, and you know, a collection will hold multiple items, and in the collections, there's both immutable collections and mutable collections. So, for example, you can have a val, a immutable reference, to a mutable collection, right? So that way, that reference always points to that data structure, but the data structure's contents can be changed, for example, right? And so, uh, in the case here, right, you know, we're able to use these vals, these references aren't changing which object they're pointing to, but as a side effect of our program, we are changing how these things are connected, right? So, uh, yes, there, 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 there's side effects. This is intentional, right? We, we do want to do this. So, in particular, this connect operator, or the, the wiring operator, that is, you know, assigning things. And so, when it's called on things, uh, it understands which is on the left-hand side versus the right-hand side. And things on the right-hand side, it uses their output. And things on the left-hand side, it sends that to the input of that side. Um, that's kind of what's going on, right? And so we, we've already seen the variable here. We don't need to print it out, but I'll maybe I'll pause here for any questions on this before I kind of uh, move on about this. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, so I'll answer the first question right away. So the question was, is this top portion basically like boilerplate we can reuse for this course for instantiating a, a module, right? Where we can pick our module name, we extend module, and then we put the ports for IOs here? Yes. However, as this course goes on, we're going to start tweaking this and extending this, right? So as we saw just a few minutes ago, we can put class parameters here to have a little bit more parameterization. Uh, another thing we'll be doing is here we have what's called an anonymous bundle. We're going to the bundle and don't give it a name, right? Uh, later on, we may choose to define our own IO interfaces and reuse those. So maybe define somewhere else, and we just say IO is you know an instance of some other class we've already defined, right? So that may also happen. But for now, yes, you can treat this kind of as mostly boilerplate. But you know, as we go through this course, you know, you'll have more chances we're going to modify this, and it'll be less mysterious. Um, and this is perhaps a good reminder. I'm going to answer one more thing before we take a second question. Uh, let's hypothetically, uh, instead of having, you know, my gate, we just had this statement right here like we had originally in the design previously. 
uh, there's still going to be an XOR gate module here, or sorry, object here, right? However, you're not going to have a reference to it. It's going to be anonymous, and you know, from Scala land, we're not going to be able to point to it, right? Because it was instantiated, and then it, it did the operation, right? It connected uh, the inputs from the inputs that it requested, and its output connected to the IO.C, and we won't even have access to it. So actually, by using this val in between, we're kind of injecting ourselves into the equation. Uh, I sometimes like to use these vowels kind of sparingly, but strategically to try to break things up. So here I'm doing it for the sake of, you know, showing a reference. Um, but, you know, other times when you have a very complicated line, you can break it up with these vowels, kind of, kind of very label components and be very clear about what's going on. Okay, great. We'll have to take your second question. Okay, second question was about the MyGate. Sure, great. Um, Cool. Yeah, so I said, I really want to take the time to get this right in the beginning of the course. That's why I'm kind of spending all this time on these, you know, box diagrams to make sure we kind of understand what's going on and kind of keep it straight between, even though we're writing software, we're generating hardware, trying to get that right, uh, that right mindset. Um, cool. So uh, now let's introduce uh, another construct. Uh, oops. Yeah, so this, this next question, I think, <laughs> is very similar to what we just saw, and I'm going to answer it right now. So um, there's actually a wire type in Chisel. Now let's talk about that, right? So um, what a wire type is, is it's saying this is going to be a connection in Chisel world, right? So uh, it actually makes an object, right? And what's nice about the wire is, you know, we need, we need to connect both sides of it, right? We need to connect the input and the output. The reason why this is very helpful is there are times when you know, you may not have both sides of the connection available to you when you want, right? So, you know, if like we saw before for that, you know, simple XOR gate, it's easy to put the XOR gate on attached directly to the output and we're done, right? But, you know, imagining another scenario or maybe in your code based on the way you're kind of building things up methodically, you may not have both the input and output known at the same time, right? So it's kind of to have a, a wire and you can connect to the wire in either order. You connect the input first, connect the output first, whatever, right? And so, you know, for example, here's, uh, you know, that, that module, it has the result we expect, right? But I can go ahead, once the wire is declared, I can actually reverse the order of these statements, for example, with no consequence, right? Um, because what happened is, you know, we created this uh, wire object. We had a scholar reference pointing to it. And okay, with this ordering, we connected its output to io.c. And then we did the my wire connected its input. It's on the left side, so it's, its input is getting connected to the output of that XOR gate, right? So that's what we did there. And see now, of course, XOR gate we just mentioned before is anonymous, right? Where we kind of just you know address an XOR gate and it builds the object for us. But we don't have a, a scholar reference to it. Um, but yeah, so we could put these in either order. We can't put it above, right? Because then of course it will not be defined. We won't know what my wire is, right? But um, it's gonna be helpful to have these wires where we can have things where we can kind of connect things and we can kind of choose when we kind of the couple when we're connecting these two things, right? And so one of those common examples is something called when, which we're gonna cover in the next slide. Um, but before we do that, I wanna spend just a little bit more time really trying to emphasize the difference between uh, wire and val. So, uh, you know, val's just a, a, a modifier on a declaration, right? And so, but the val from the previous slide uh, this is just a reference, right? So this is a, you know, chisel object of an XOR gate here, and my gate points to that. Now, on this slide, uh, we declared a wire. So wire is actually a chisel object, and my wire uh, is our Scala reference that points to it. And then these connection statements are kind of filling in the rest of the graph, right? We're, okay, now we're going to make an XOR gate, and attach its output because it's on the right side to the le left side, which is the input of my wire. And then we're going to attach my wire to the output. Um, and so uh, wire in Chisel is much more analogous to uh, wire in Verilog, I suggested by chat. Yes. But these, these are great questions. I'll make sure we get this very, very clear. <laughs> Uh, great. Uh, I guess we're going to keep going. So, um, as I mentioned before, there's another construct we're going to use. It's called when. And so, uh, 
I, I have some personal gripes with the name, but let's talk about what it does. Uh, what it does is it's a chisel construct. When the condition is true, this body happens. If it's not true, or sorry, it, it, now, what does that mean, right? Because we're talking about hardware and you're talking about kind of topology connecting things together. So what, what does it mean? Well, uh, it's just saying, you know, based on this input, right? So under the hood, this is all going to get turned into muxes. So we're actually we're using this as an initial example to make a mux, right? We've already made mux a few different ways. This is a parameterized mux. Now we're doing it um, with a when statement. So you can see that, you know, it's still a mux. We still have that very log ternary, but we have a when, right? So what's cool about this when is, you know, if this is true, connect these two. If that, you know, otherwise else, connect these two, right? So as a reminder, right, this is a chisel construct. So this is producing hardware. So we're going to have both paths in our hardware. And so it's this, so uh, these connections are going to happen, but in this case, it's kind of a question of who gets what, right? So the chisel tools under the hood are going to kind of figure out the cases for us, right? So in this case, you know, um, both paths touch the exact same output and, you know, they're exclusive, ca they're, you know, exclusive cases, right? There may be other scenarios where it's not quite so clear and it's going to kind of do the ordering, right? And we'll talk about the ordering in just a few minutes, but um, this one construct that said is, you know, if the condition is true, uh, these connects or operations in here are valid. You can put a uh, regular Scala in here, but realize the Scala of course is locked in by braces. So it's scopes. So if I define a val here, uh, you know, I can't refer to that out here. Oops, I can do five, of course, but I can't do X. Um, oops, really? I thought that would be scoped. That might break it. Nope, it doesn't. I'm crazy. Okay, but oh, great point. It might be not the same X. So make this X uh, 14. Yes, great. Thank you. That was a wonderful save by the TA. The TA pointed out that there probably was an X already inside my namespace. Um, but uh, it has these things happen, right? And so when is kind of like an if, it's kind of way you think about it. Uh, there's an else when, which is like an if else. And then there's an else when, which is kind of like a, like a full on else. Now, this is one of those moments where they've done their best to try to make this feel like a natural syntax, but uh, there's a few wrinkles. Number one, when you're using whens, you have to put the braces. Even for a one-liner, you have to put the braces. Additionally, for the dot otherwise and dot else when, you actually need to put the dots in. They aren't optional. Uh, there are some circumstances in Scala, in which case you can actually remove the dot when calling out you know, a method on something. Unfortunately, this way and the kind of way the syntax worked out, the dot has to be there. And so uh, that's kind of what happens. And then there's a question from chat about, oh wait, you know, is this when construct kind of like an arbitrary mux thing? Yes, and so I think the way I would think about when is the muxes are implicit, right? Before with the mux uh, thing I showed you or some of other things in the library, like, you know, may mux case or whatever, those are explicit muxes, this is implicit, right? We're just, they're defining what happens and um, you can go, to, you can really go to town with these whens, right? You can have nested whens, uh, you can have situations where not every case is covered. So for example, we could just uh, have this, oops, let's go ahead and show what happens. It's going to complain or it should uh, complain that I don't have a default value on iota out, right? Um, and the issue is, you know, okay, if the when is true, I have an assignment to iota out. But if the when is not true, what the heck value is it supposed to be for iota out, right? We can't have disconnected hardware. It doesn't make sense. Um, so we're going to come down in just a second with the last next semantics. But uh, for now, I just wanted to kind of point out that, yeah, it's actually doing some pretty cool stuff under the hood, kind of doing the, you know, logic reduction based on, you know, how it should be uh, interpreted. But in the end of the day, all you're doing is selecting cases, right? So at a minimum, you're selecting between, you know, is this thing true or not true? Uh, but, you know, what possibilities of otherwise and elsewhere, maybe there's other things, situations as well. Um, have another question, please go ahead. Uh, 
Uh, to be honest, uh, I think their messages inside the Jupyter environment are, are pretty pretty junk. Um, fortunately, when you're doing the proper development uh, with like an IDE and like a regular Scala project, I'll say they're better. I won't say they're great, but I'll say they're better. Uh, like I said, what's going on under the hood here is the stuff that uh, our TA has validly put together, building on other people's prior work, um, is a way to actually execute Scala inside these notebooks, right? Or actually Scala, but actually Chisel, right? So it's, you know, doing a lot of tricks, kind of combining a lot of libraries together. And so as a result, uh, the line attribution, line number attribution is a little confusing because, of course, we don't see line numbers inside this view, as well as these are line numbers in a file that was generated by concatting together uh, multiple other, you know, files to create the script, right? And so, yeah, um, when you're doing these notebooks, it's part of why trying to keep it really short, is that way hopefully you can uh, see uh, the area yourself. Um, for larger development, you get much better error messages uh, with the uh, proper tool flows rather than this kind of, you know, hack together Jupyter thing. But Jupyter thing is fun for us to kind of, you know, play these things and try things out. No problem. Cool. Okay. And then uh, we can keep going. Yeah. So uh, I just mentioned this a second ago, so now let's get down to this in detail. Uh, there's this notion of what's called a last connect semantics, right? So um, up until now, there hasn't really much of a notion of ordering in our modules, right? You know, yes, there's the order of Scala programs evaluated, but, you know, as I showed you earlier at that wire, you know, we could change the order of connect statements and that was okay. Um, but what happens if we're connecting the same thing on the same side, right? So before that wire, we were taking the input and output in different orders, but at the end of the day, it was only one input, and at the end of the day, it was only one output. The question is, what happens if I connect the same wire on the same side multiple times? Which one wins? Well, with the last next semantics, the one that's last in program order, i.e. most recent, is the one that wins. And it's kind of understandable to see how that happens, right? You know, our statements here are, you know, creating chisel objects and having the chisel objects modify who they point to. And so simply the last one those executes is the one that wins. And the good news is if you write your module in a reasonable order, this doesn't lead to very, this leads to very, you know, expectable, unsurprising uh, results, right? So to kind of drive this point home here, we have uh, this little te uh, demo module. So uh, we had to declare a wire and what do we do? Well, we first connect it to one and then we do a one statement, right? And yes, we connect the uh, output to uh, that wire. But the point is, you can see that if I didn't have this one, right? Okay, I just assign my output to one, easy. You know, chisels under the hood, you know, not even bothering to have the W in the output in Verilog, kind of simplify that out, replace that out. But now with this when statement, right? Now it has to make the choice, right? It's saying, oh, wait, you know, um, if I out X is true, this whole body, uh, you know, happens or, you know, occur, uh, you know, is enabled, right? So the connection uh, from W is made to seven and then W is connected to IO later on. Um, and so, uh, so that, that, that's, that's okay, right? So in this case, what we're doing is, yeah, okay, so you can see what happens, right? If IOX is true, then we get seven, all right? So if IOX is true, we get the seven. If IO um, dot X is, you know, not true, then we get the one, right? And so in this case, right, like before, if I didn't have this kind of like default assignment, it's going to yell at me, right? Because once again, I have this con conditional attachment, right? So it's conditional. It's like, wait, what, what, what happens? You know, Chisel's under hood checking all the cases, making sure they're all covered. Uh, if you have a default value, then you have the, then you have the option of overwriting it. Um, another really minor problem to point out, I actually didn't bother specifying the uint bit width. Uh, and so what happened? Uh, it uh, inferred the bit width. And the inference tools recognizes that, oh, wait, uh, there's actually two possibilities for w, right? w could be 1 or 7. So 1 bit, uh, 1 only needs 1 bit to represent that, right? However, the 7 is going to require uh, 3 bits. And so it recognizes that that propagates that totally just fine. And so it recognizes that this output is going to, in the end of the day, have up to three bits, right? Okay, so I have a few more questions coming in about this.
and so we, we can we can go ahead and talk about a few distinct theories coming up. So one was wait a second, I just reassigned uh, this W. How is that possible, right? Shouldn't that be impossible with Val? Remember, we did not reassign W. Uh, w is a scalar reference that still points to the same chisel wire object. That has not changed. Uh, what has changed is what it's connected to, right? Um, before, it's connected to the literal one. Uh, and then uh, alternatively, uh, you know, now it's in the one block and this is going to get turned into the hardware into a mux, right? It's going to figure that out. Uh, so it could be connected to a one, could be connected to a seven. And, you know, this when statement now kind of gets turned into a mux, right? And so, like I said, there's some, there's some stuff under the hood of how Chisel, you know, originally has a when statement, how it turns into muxes and figures it out. But for now, you can just think of it as W never changed, right? W is still a wire. Originally, the wire is connected to a one. After this when, the wire is connected to uh, a mux, choosing between the one and, and the seven. Um, so I saw a follow-up question from chat asking about, wait a second, even though, you know, we're not changing our vowels, we are kind of changing uh, these chisel objects, right? So we're mutating these chisel objects. Doesn't that little, you know, break this whole, you know, let's be immutable goal we had with Scala? Yes, yes it does. Um, however, I argue if this is done judiciously and in the right way, it leads to code that is arguably more understandable or readable, right? So in this contrived example, of course, we wouldn't need to take advantage of last connect semantics. We could just declare, you know, a mux in one line to choose between the two things. However, there'll be other cases in your design where this actually leads to a very concise expression that's arguably still very readable about certain behaviors. You can imagine maybe in a large block, you know, if some input signal comes in, a whole bunch of things need to happen. When the input signal does not come in, uh, it is going to not do those things or do something else, right? Um, so uh, a follow-up question coming in from chat. Uh, is asking, wait a second, you know, what exactly is this little thing doing? So yes, to be, to be absolutely clear, this colon equals, that is a function that chisel implements, right? So when you do this, it is like saying w dot colon equals on one dot u. So actually, this might not even break. We'll see. This will be kind of fun. Yep, that works. So gross, <laughs> but uh, it works, right? So here's a little bit of you know, peeling away what's going on behind Chisel. Uh, so yes, so what we are doing is uh, we are calling this colon equals method on the W object, the wire object, with the argument 1.u. That's what's happening, right? So like I said, that uh, the W object itself internally may be mutating or changing what it's pointing to, but a reference to W is not what's changing, right? And so why can we get away with this? There's a few things going on here. Uh, number one, in Scala, uh, it's possible when you make function calls to often replace the dot with a space and it can figure it out syntactically. It's pretty cool. This is a feature to put in the language for purposes just like this to help people make DSLs. Um, additionally, uh, you know, when you're calling a function with this kind of an abbreviated syntax, especially when there's one argument, uh, you can uh, omit the prints. And so that's kind of this embedded DSLness uh, at work. Um, now, uh, there's you know some back and forth, some style guides about when should you include that dot when invoking a, a function and when should you have parens on our input arguments. Um, but uh, this is a little bit of peek what's going on. But, but the big thing is, yes, this colon equals is something that we explicitly uh, that we, I'm sorry, the chisel creators explicitly chose to put in the language, right? Uh, and remember, this is the question from the prior lecture was, wait a second, why do we have this colon equals rather than equals, right? Well, if we used equals, we would be attempting to reassign W, which we can't do or shouldn't do if it's a vowel. Um, but by colon equals, we're making this additional method for a wire connection, right? Uh, this is kind of what's going on, right? Um, and so that's what we were just talking about is this whole notion where, you know, thanks to some of these you know, syntactic sugar things in, this, in Scala, we can kind of make it look like a proper language, but really we're calling the connect method on W with the argument 1.u. 
Uh, I think I saw another question come in via chat that might have been answered by a classmate. Can't we see in the output that it actually isn't being reassigned? Correct, right? So remember that, you know, hardware is, uh, once it exists, it's, you know, there's, you know, some number of gates and wires, right? You're not going to like dynamically move those around, right? So the chisel tool flow has to take your description for behavior and turn it into a concrete hardware description, right? And so in this case, we want to have this conditional behavior in the actual hardware circuit that's going to be captured by a MUX, right? And so this is what happens to this particular um, way we described our circuit, where we kind of chose to have a default value and then conditionally overwrite it. Uh, that is at least in the circumstances, right? But I mean, uh, this is a common way we often will use the when statements. Uh, you'll see other cases in the coming lectures where it's very common. It's kind of our main way of having that kind of adaptability to our generated design. Great questions. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, there's a continuing chat, keep going. Um, cool, but yeah, so this is really important to kind of clear up, so we'll make sure we're kind of clear about what's a chisel object versus what's a, a Scala reference. Another question, yes, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so I, I can briefly describe, so the question was, you know, how are we getting this variable? Where is this coming from? Is it coming from here? Exactly. So this is um, a few things going on. So this is us instantiating the module, and we're not even bothering to name it. We're just instantiating an instance of it. So okay, new module, anonymous instance. Uh, get Verilog is a helper function specific to this notebook. It's not even a chisel thing. Uh, it's specific to this notebook, but it's really helpful for us to learn, right? If you want to go and see what hardware we're generating and what's happening, uh, that kind of shows it to us right away. Um, and then uh, get Verilog returns, uh, you know, a, a string. If we want to actually print it out, we, we print it out. Um, great. Uh, cool, great questions. Um, okay, I think we're right on schedule. Perfect. Okay, so we've been a little fast and loose with bit widths, right? How wide some of these signals are. So, you know, things like uints or essence are multi-bit or could be down to one bit. Uh, bool, of course, is a single bit. Uh, there's more data types we'll cover in the coming weeks, but even a uint, you know, essence has the number of bits. The question is, how is that number of bits chosen? Um, and so we talked before how there's an inference capability, right? So this, for example, in this case, where we set the input widths of our inputs, uh, the bit widths are inputs, but we didn't bother setting the width of the outputs, well, it's going to work just fine, right? Um, so what happens? Well, uh, in Scala, or sorry, in, in Chisel, we can be a little bit deliberate about what we want to do, right? So uh, we can um, mainly set bit widths, right? And depending on the relative sizes, right? If they're the same, of course, it connects directly. Uh, if one is bigger, it's going to truncate. And if one is too small, it's going to actually extend it. And if it's a uint, it zero extends it. And if it's um, uh, a uh, essent, it's going to sign extent. Um, so let's, let's, let's see some of these cases, right? So, okay, so let's say, for example, uh, we made this to be uh, smaller. Uh, what's going to happen? Um, it's going to, you know, reference a subset of the bits, right? This is a 8-bit signal. It's referencing only 7 bits, right? Because we're truncating the top bit, the most significant bit. Uh, you know, if I made this uh, bigger, right? If I said the output's bigger, it's going to go ahead and zero extend and put that zero on for me. And so one thing you're going to see when Chisel generates Verilog, it is very deliberate. It uh, likes to do only one operation per line. So it invented this, you know, uh, new node, underscore T1. You know, the underscore leading is kind of a hint that this came from, uh, you know, the Chisel processing. So that way it's only one operation per line. So humans don't usually write Verilog like this, but this actually is really good for tools, right? So number one, we can be very deliberate about making sure we have very predictable things. But actually when it comes to being passed into tools downstream, this leads to very predictable results, right? Sometimes when you have a lot of operations on the same lines, it's a common problem for humans designing real chips. They think they know what they're doing, and inadvertently there's somewhere along the way where something is, you know, being casted, extended, truncated in a way they perhaps didn't anticipate for all these operators combined, or an evaluation or they perhaps didn't understand. And it's really subtle bugs hard to find. Uh, but breaking into one operation per line uh, it's really easy to kind of track and debug these things out, but also the tools eat this up, right? And so by doing it one per line, of course, there's no change in hardware efficiency. 
Uh, it's just a little bit more verbose Verilog. Remember, the Verilog we're producing, except for us right now looking at it for educational purposes, usually we don't look at it. Usually we give that to the tools and let the tools do the work, right? Um, this is kind of a little detail. Okay. So, uh, okay, I'm going to pause these questions now before I go on to these other operators. Yes, please go ahead. So, so the clock and reset, you see them here in this generated Verilog. They're actually in every module has an implicit clock and reset. So it's implicit. Um, we'll cover that next week. But for now, uh, you know, just understand, okay, yes, it's there. We aren't using it. And then, of course, a, a good CAD tool in processing this Verilog is going to know to prune that away because it's not being used. That's like the code elimination. Yes, yeah, so, so, so that's, that's the remainder of the slides. The question was asking about, wait a second, Wayne, why are we, you know, uh, appending a zero when, um, you know, we know that addition could actually potentially be bigger because of the carry bit. So that's what these other operators are for and these other comments are for, right? So the default plus uh, in chisel behaves like this other plus. So actually chisel actually has three different plus operations, right? Uh, so what are they? So the one you're going to use most of the time is default plus. What it does is it keeps them the same width, right? The output's the same width as the other two, right? So in other words, if I'm adding two n-bit numbers, you're right mathematically, it's possible if there's a carry, the result could be n plus one bits. If you use this plus sign, it behaves the same as this version with the modulus symbol, and it's going to truncate, right? That's kind of why they chose that syntax. Now, um, so that's going to have the same... Uh, result. Now, if I, and in passing it's even better if I actually, um, I shall, I'll leave this alone and that way you'll see that how it's inferring, right? So it's inferring that, yes, you know, the, the output width is the exact same as the input width for both the regular plus as well as the plus with the modulus symbol. Now, uh, if I don't want to lose any information and I want to grow to accommodate that, there is the other variant, right? And that's going to grow the output to make sure there's no loss of precision. So this is in the case of addition where, you know, n bit numbers makes n plus one, you know, for example, for multiplication, in order to make sure you lose it, you have to have, you know, two of the n bits if you have two n bit numbers. There's all sorts of like rules about, oh, what's for different widths, how does it turn out? If you aren't sure, you can look that up inside the, the chisel cheat sheet I've linked here. Uh, you can kind of see a table and see for certain operations uh, what's going on. For the most part, you know, most people most of the time are content uh, with, uh, you know, like this uh, plus operation, which, you know, is linked, uh, you know, to this, to the modulus, you know, the truncating version. Um, and yes, there's, there's potential for overflow because you aren't actually capturing that, that, that uh, carry bit. Um, I think that might have kind of covered that a little bit. Um, great. Uh, more questions? Or the hand still raised? Okay, well, um, as kind of an additional example, I can show, okay, so we can show, like, you know, the n plus 1. And, yeah, we saw it, 0 extended for the uint. Uh, we can go ahead, if we want to, uh, you know, make these essence. And there we see a sign extending, right, where it's not just putting anything here. It's putting the most uh, significant bit and repeating that. That's that Verilog syntax for repeating uh, the upper bit. Um, but that's, that's what we did essence, right? We could do this normally with uh, uints. Uh, and, you know, hopefully normally, if you have things with varying bit widths, you are being pretty deliberate about why you're changing things around. Um, in both Verilog and Scala, or in Chisel, right, you know, if you have different bit widths interacting with things and 
either truncating or extending things in places you don't expect that can lead to hard to find errors, right? So um, what are some techniques to try to cope with that? One of them is at times taking advantage of the fact that widths can be inferred. And that way you don't have to worry about getting your things right in certain places. You can just take advantage of being inferred. In other cases, you can pass the parameters around, right? If you know that, for example, you want to be an adder and you want to definitely keep it the same, then yeah, you want to keep it the same. Or you don't want to be n plus one, you make it n plus one. Okay, great. Um, so, so, so to confirm that was not a question, there's a hand raise, that's why I keep checking back. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and put that into an example, right? Um, so uh, here we're converting from sine and magnitude, the way we're representing a sine number, to two's complement. Now, of course, like I said, Essent is already available inside of uh, Chisel. So for doing sine stuff, there is stuff already supported there. But this is just showing another example, right? So what are we doing? Well, uh, OK, we have um, you know, our, our input. Um, and uh, we are choosing uh, you know, to do two's comment. So two's comment, the way it works is uh, if it's negative, meaning the, the sine bit is 1, you need to negate the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, bitwise not, you need to negate the thing and then add 1 to it. Uh, or if it's 0, if there, you know, the magnitude is 0, the sine bit is 0, you just pass the magnitude straight through, right? So, um, of course, we have our uh, design. This is kind of what we were just talking about a second ago, right? So, uh, the interesting wrinkle here, of course, oops. That shouldn't have a one extension there. Oops, did I put in the wrong one? Okay, um, what if you take out the inference for just a moment and see what we get? Okay, I think that's more along what I expected. Um, so what, what's happening here, right? So. Uh, you know, in the mux at the end, right, we're choosing based on sign. And either we're taking uh, underscore t1, uh, which is the result of negating the magnitude thing and adding 1 to it. And uh, or uh, we are 0 extending the magnitude, right, which makes sense, right? So if the sign bit is 0, that means the positive number. And in two's complement, if it's a positive number, the upper bit's going to be zero, right? So that makes sense. That we're going to have a zero being appended up here. Uh, and then uh, we just pass the bank two straight through. So this is an example we were seeing from earlier about, you know, uh, using that when to kind of conditionally attach things, right? So sometimes the when is, you know, more clear, right? Or maybe, you know, you might be the kind of person that finds this way of writing it less clear as, you know, thinking about it this way, right? and then conditionally overwriting it. And we're going to get uh, basically the same hardware. Oops, set the rerun over here too. Yeah. Um, cool. Great. I think I have only one more slide. Oh, yes. We have. Um, so we talked about this indirectly, and that's kind of worth getting us into directly, right? And that is talking about the bits themselves, right? So we talked here, numbers kind of this aggregate whole. However, there's times where you may want to access a few bits at a time, right? So if you use parentheses, you can just uh, access, uh, you know, bits at certain indices, right? So least significant is zero, most significant is, you know, the length minus one. Um, so if I want bit n, you know, I do x of n. Uh, as a side note, in Scala for their arrays, they use parens rather the rounded parens rather than square brackets for array anything. So that's kind of consistent with that. Uh, you also get a bit range. So if I want to get you know some number of bits, uh, I can do that as well. I can say I want some high to low, no problem. Uh, like other languages, you want to concatenate signals together. That you know put all the signals, all the wires from one signals and all the wires from another signal. That's concatenation or just cat. Uh, as well as fill, which is another thing we saw in some of these very long examples where if you want to repeat something, in this case, it doesn't need to be a single bit. It could be, you know, a few bits, and you can repeat that n times. So kind of putting all these ideas together, we have this sign extender module, right? So in this case, someone's given us a number, and as I said before, right, there is essence in the language. This is just a 
artificial example to kind of show the features, and something that's kind of a very simple example. But assuming somebody gives us a number, in this case it's encoded as a uint, and we're going to output a uint, we want to uh, sign extend it, right? So uh, there's a few things going on here. So let's go through it. So we are going to you know, make sure that there's our input width and our uh, output width, right? We're making sure that our input width is you know, non-zero, uh, and we're making sure our output width um, is greater because we actually want to extend it. Uh, believe it or not, in Chisel, if you actually have things that are of width zero, it often is pretty good about figuring out how to prune that away uh, for zero bit wires. But for now, we don't want to deal with that, so we're going to leave it uh, as this. So these are, these are some Scala level of certs. These are not in the hardware, these are in the Scala to make sure this is being run on reasonable inputs. But then, what's the sign extension? Well, the sign extension, of course, is we want to take the most significant bit, right, which is, uh, you know, this thing, and then we want to um, repeat it to fill in the remaining bits we need and then concatenate that before or input, right? So this is gonna do the right thing, right? And so we, in the end, we're gonna get, you know, our, our mux, uh, which uh, is going to choose the extension bit at the top, right? And it's either gonna be all ones if the most of it was a one or all zeros if it was a zero. Now, for those of you who are Verilog veterans, going back to some of our prior slides, you'd be like, wait a second, why didn't it choose to do like the Verilog style fills like this or, uh, or here's a better example one of the other ones. Um, it doesn't know how to do that in this case, but the hardware that's produced, especially for the CAD tools optimized, it will be will be equivalent. Um, but the way we've written it, uh, perhaps as you can see, this is a little bit dense of a line, right? So maybe, just for me as a human trying to make sense of this, I can kind of semi-document what I'm doing, making it a little more clear by my variable choices, right? So maybe instead of doing it like this, I can say, you know what? Uh, what am I doing here? Uh, I can call this MSB, or maybe I'll even call this, uh, you know, uh, the sign bit, and then I can tell myself, okay, uh, yeah, why don't I go ahead and do that? It still produces hardware. Yes, technically Chisel's going to produce a, a Verilog wire, but remember this wire is going to be appropriately optimized by the downstream CAD tools, right? So it's not going to produce uh, more expensive hardware. And this is the same as maybe, you know, uh, maybe I'll even uh, name this other portion, right? Uh, you know, the extension, right, for example, maybe it makes it a little bit more clear to kind of break this up. So maybe I'll call this portion the extension. And so, yes, the variable extension is getting a little bit longer. But remember, in terms of absolute hardware complexity, there's zero change, right? It's just, yes, the way uh, Chisels is emitting it as very long is getting a little bit more verbose, but it's still producing the exact same thing, right? And it's just kind of helpful for us to kind of see this. And, uh, you know, arguably sometimes when this is done to a reasonable extent, uh, this can be make things more clear, right? Now, of course, you can imagine where it's too piecemeal, too bite-sized, gets kind of tedious. There's, there's kind of a balance for how much you want to break up these complex expressions. But I just wanted to show this something to kind of consider is one of the themes for this course, right? It's you know, designed for readability. So think about what's going to make this clear for you later on or someone else looking at this code, figuring out what was it trying to do here and what do these different pieces do? Um, and so a question was about the indexing. So yes, to be very clear in indexing uh, in Scala, as well as Chisel, indexing is done with the rounded parentheses. The square brackets, uh, we're gonna see them pretty rarely inside Scala. When we do see square brackets in Scala, those are gonna be typically for providing templated uh, types. Um, but otherwise, you know, we use rounded parentheses uh, because they are just uh, used for function calls and accessing an indexable a structure such as a uint or an array as we'll see later on, that's simply just a function call. So we're going to use those rounded parents for those. Great. And I, that's the last slide and we're perfectly out of time. Before we all sign off, I do want to draw one's attention to as I mentioned on the Slack. Uh, we've posted the lab. Uh, we also already start providing access to our internal compute systems. If you want to do stuff on your own, on your own computers, that's great. For the labs, in order to submit it, we prefer you use our system so that way we can do the auto grading all stuff there. And so our instructions posted on the canvas and we'll continue to add more instructions and continue to add more things to the websites. We'll also be adding homework one shortly and that'll be publicly available and you can do that on your own home platform and then submit that via Gradescope uh, later on. Thank you folks, have a good weekend. I'll stand just for a minute for questions.